Hi, good evening. I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, so glad to, everyone could make it to uh, the undergraduate lecture series um, sponsored by Ecosystem Sustainability and Justice major. Hey! Uh, big, uh, my name is Hugh Pocock. I'm the uh, uh, faculty advisor. Uh, for the major at this point. And, uh, but the main thing I wanna plug is the show while you're waiting for Apocalypse, which is uh, opening now and its reception is tomorrow at 5 p.m. So please come. Uh, we are uh, really, really fortunate in having artist Bruce Willen be ESJ's sort of inaugural uh, undergraduate lecture series artist to come and speak with us. Um, uh, the, the major is in its first year getting going and they were like, you gotta get a, an artist to come in. It's like, oh man, we gotta get an artist to come in. And um, uh, I, uh, uh, Bruce's projects, uh, Gross Rivers were in Baltimore and uh, I lived in Baltimore for a while and I've always been an admirer of uh, Bruce's work. And um, I remember someone describing that there was this artist who was a uh, Micah graphic design major who started this typography um, uh, studio and he was a punk rock musician. And I was like, wow, my world has just grown immeasurably of what art and design can do here in Baltimore. So it was very cool. So um, I want to read um, and uh, also inviting Bruce in uh, Bruce's uh, work really sort of in some ways really f um, inhabits the space of the ecosystem sustainability and justice major in that the interdisciplinary nature of Bruce's work from design to public site to social themes to ecological themes to also using sort of uh, uh, this kind of really nice blend of art and design throughout his work really speaks a lot to what uh, the, the students in the major are doing. Um, Bruce is a multidisciplinary designer, artist, musician, educator, and the principal of public mechanics, a studio focusing on works for public and cultural spaces. Throughout his practice, he seeks to bring new perspectives to everyday places, objects, language, and histories. Bruce's recent work aims to decent, deepen engagement with the landscapes, systems, and symbols around us, fostering moments of discovery and play that open new ways of, to experience our shared cultural and physical spaces. Prior to public mechanics, Bruce co-founded acclaimed design studio Post Pythography, where he led high-profile projects that have shaped the visual language of Baltimore and beyond. His work has appeared on the covers of Time Magazine, The New York Times, and ESPN, and a dozens of design books and periodicals, including a Post Typography monograph. He is co-author of the book Lettering and Type, and has written for The Washington Post, Design Observer, and other publications. As part of his interdisciplinary practice, Bruce composes and performs music and sound and sound art, including several new silent film scores with the instrumental duo Peels. Bruce has performed in clock towers, museums, and living rooms on multiple continents and has released recordings with legendary indie label Thrill Jockey Records. Prior to Peels, Bruce contributed to Baltimore's music scene for nine years as a member of the inf influential post-punk band Double Dagger subject of the 2013 documentary film, If We Shout Loud Enough. Welcome, Bruce Willen. Uh, hello, um, th thanks so much, Hugh, uh, for the great introduction, and um, yeah, for the ESJ department for, or major for having me and inviting me, I'm yeah, really excited to uh, share some work with you all. Um, yeah, again, it's my name. Um, I am a designer, artist, musician. I do other stuff too. Uh, I uh, run a small design practice called Public Mechanics. And my most of the work that I am doing is sort of in this space at this kind of intersection um, that, you know, I think as Hugh mentioned, I. I definitely have a pretty interdisciplinary practice, and um, we were, you know, chatting beforehand a little about this talk and, you know, what 
you know, some of the students in the major are doing. And, you know, I wanted to try and keep, keep things fairly informal. I'll, I'm going to share some work. You all feel free to ask me some questions afterwards about process, how I got here, all of that. Um, but before I, before I share some projects, I wanted to talk a little bit about punk rock. Uh, this was Double Dagger, uh, as Hugh mentioned, a band that I played in for nine years with my friends Nolan and Denny. Uh, Nolan and I were both graphic designers. We, we went to Micah, we met at Micah, um, started off playing in a band together when we were here called League of Death. Um, we, we thought we were gonna be metal, but we really weren't good enough with our instruments to play metal. Um, but sort of after school, we thought it'd be funny to start a concept band that incorporated graphic design metaphors into the lyrics. And we even named the band after a typographic symbol, the double dagger, which looks like that and is primarily used to denote footnotes in text. Um, so we added a footnote to this t-shirt. Um, for some of our early songs had titles like Command X, Command V, and comic book lettering, kind of give, giving you an idea of where, uh, where we were coming from. Um, but we uh, kind of like, we sort of evolved, we evolved fairly quickly, got um, tired of using the graphic design metaphors and the lyrics. Um, and even though Nolan wasn't singing about CMYK anymore, we, the, the graphic design influence was still pretty apparent in all of the band's visual output. You know, being a graphic designer in a band gives you tons of opportunities to experiment, you know, design all your own show posters and flyers, t-shirts, album covers. Uh, we created hundreds and hundreds of posters and flyers for our shows and tours, um, designed and screen printed a lot of our own album packaging. This was a this was an EP that we released that had these three different um, kind of like limited edition covers with uh, die cut eye holes in all of the masks. So depending on which direction you inserted the um, CD or the LP sleeve, uh, you, the eyes would change color. So we got to you know we were sort of our own client and it gave us a chance to just have fun and experiment with different projects. Also coming from this DIY punk background, uh, you know, really influenced the way that we approached uh, design and you know, the way I continue to still approach my work. You know, when you're in a punk band, a lot of times you're working with a pretty limited set of resources, a lot of constraints, like maybe you're playing in a basement with no PA system and you have to figure out how to make that work. Um, this was uh, for a tour that we were doing where we, we ran out of time and money to make really cool screen printed posters and mail them out. So we just basically like threw together this PDF Mad Lib that we emailed to all the promoters a couple weeks before the tour. And we were just like, fill this out however you want. Um, these, these were some of the, uh, some funny ones from Easy Street Records in Seattle. Uh, being in the band also really, it, it really influenced the way that I think about how audiences experience art. We, we tried like really intentionally to kind of like break down the wall between performer and audience and to kind of remove the stage and invite the crowd to become part of the show. Um, you kind of, you know, add, add this level of like chaos and participation. And the... The band also led to Nolan and I starting a design studio in 2007 called Post Typography. So this, you know, this collaboration that we started off kind of musically and just like working on projects together, we were like, let's, let's see if we can make this into a business and do this, the same work for clients. So since this is a short talk, I'm just gonna like, you know, click through a whole bunch of Post Typography's design work. Um, we did tons and tons of projects, everything from book, book jacket designs to album packaging, editorial illustrations, magazine covers, uh, publication design and layout, signage, branding and logos, uh, Parkway Theater, um, posters, murals, books, uh, I don't know, a lot of different, like a lot of different stuff. 
Um, you know, and we were working with the, you know, at the time we, at one point we were, you know, a studio of six people. So we were able to get a lot done, but all, all good things come to an end. Um, in 2019, uh, Nolan and I parted ways with post typography, um, amicably, despite what this photo makes it look like. Um, and, uh, we, we, I think we were both like ready to like start new things, and Nolan also was uh, moving to another state. So I, I founded a, a new studio, um, a new practice called Public Mechanics, with the idea that I, I really wanted to be intentional about like the kind of work that I was doing and the spaces that I was working in. Um, in particular, I wanted to focus on like, public, uh, public space and cultural work. Um, projects including. Uh, more of a focus on public art projects, self-initiated work, as well as uh, you know client-driven work that was you know focused on the things I was interested in. And at, you know, as I was kind of moving from this really like super intense world of running a design studio and like like struggling to keep my head above water, you know, keeping the small business afloat, I wanted to be, be more intentional about some of the themes that I was looking for in my own practice and wanted to explore. And the, you know, these are some of them. I really wanted to do work that you know, created frictions, asked questions, inspired play, exploration, serendipity, participation. And not coincidentally, these are, I, I think, some things that really help, help to create engaging public spaces as well. So as I, you know, sort of kind of was embarking on this new venture of you know working more in public space, uh, one of the first projects that I, I worked on um, was a public art project uh, in Washington D.C. called the Chairs, and it, it was part of a, a it's kind of the design brief for the project was to create a playable piece of public art, um, kind of an alternative play space, not a playground per se, but something that created these alternative uh, opportunities for play and engagement. Um, and it's in front of a, a public library in Anacostia. And it worked with a really incredible set of collaborators on this project, including Tim Schofield, who's a metal worker and sculptor who did all the fabrication work on the project, uh, Katrina and Bryony from the Neighborhood Design Center. Um, and the Neighborhood Design Center does a lot of great work, uh, community engagement work and public space design. And we, you know, one of the first things that we did was we met, uh, met with the library staff and some groups that needed the library um, and try and just like understand like, you know, what, what does the space need? What are kind of some of the parameters of this project? Um, the main takeaway, you know, sort of over and over again is that there needed to be more seating in the library plaza. So kind of like quite literally, I took the approach very literally <laughs> and came up with this concept that creates a series of these uh, kind of like playful sculptural chairs and benches, um, these sort of surreal uh, twists to you know, a standard chair. The project also references neighborhood history. This is a, the big chair of Anacostia, which is kind of a roadside attraction in the neighborhood that's a, at the site of an old furniture factory. And uh, I proposed this suite, basically this suite of these 12 different uh, playful seats um, and uh, benches that were, that we pitched them to the library. And then uh, we did, had conducted a few workshops working with the librarians, um, some teen groups that met at the library to help choose the pieces that would you know, make the most sense at the space, help you know, design the actual lay, uh, layout of the plaza, you know, because you know, these are the people who are here every day and they see how like neighbors are like coming into the library and like using the space. Uh, teenagers also, they, they have very strong opinions about color. So they give us some, some good advice. And the, the final installation uh, wound up uh, comprising eight different pieces that are spread across the library plaza. Uh, maybe eight different chairs and benches. And each of the pieces uh, was designed specifically to create these different opportunities for play and interaction. Uh, this, this one is called the yoga chair. And it's uh, really a, 
kind of like a, a favorite piece for like younger visitors to the library. So it creates this kind of like tiny jungle gym that they can climb all over. Uh, the skewed chairs, which is, is kind of like optical illusion. Um, and this one was kind of, I think, the most fun to figure out how to make it work because I had to really like change the proportion of the materials and the design that, that was used to uh, you know, accentuate this optical illusion as you move around the chair. Uh, the seesaw bench that has this fulcrum in the center. So you can kind of bounce on it with your friends or just hang out. Uh, the friends chairs that, it's a little hard to see in this photo, but there's two chairs with the backs are interlocked. And the way that the seats are actually designed, it kind of, when you sit on it, it sort of encourages you to turn to face the person who's sitting behind you. The pyramid chair uh, was originally, um, we had originally designed it to be an, another story tall, taller, but we had to scale it back for liability reasons. But it, it was still cool to see after we installed these, people started using uh, all of these uh, the seats in ways both that I thought they might use them, but in new ways. I actually saw some folks having a business meeting on, on this chair as, <laughs> uh, you know, as I was out there photographing one day. Um, this is the frown bench, and of course, the smile bench to go with it, and the rainbow chair. So, you know, this, when you're working on a public project, you know, as I was saying at the beginning, it's really important to try and you know, understand the context as best you can, and get, get a sense of how people might interact with and use and experience your pieces, but you don't really know 100% until it actually gets out there into the world. And, it, you know, this being, this is really my first big, uh, like kind of like larger scale public art project. And it, it's been like really cool to see, you know, come back a few years later and see how it's like become part of the community. And folks in Anacostia have, and visitors to the library really have embraced the project as, you know, we'd, we'd hoped that they would when we installed it. Um, we actually, uh, had to deinstall some of the pieces for some repairs um, last summer, and everyone was coming into the library ask, asking when they were going to come back. So it, it felt it was like really cool to hear hear this feedback um, from the work. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So another project that I did that was on on a much kind of smaller, more temporary scale, but also just really incorporates the similar themes of play and participation, serendipity. During, uh, during the pandemic, you know, like many of us, I was spending a lot more time walking around the city. And, you know, on these walks, I would encounter the orphaned mitten or glove that, you know, we've all seen them forlorn, lying run over in the street or in a snowbank or in the, under the bushes. And I, I started collecting them with the idea of uh, creating some, some kind of project or installation around them. And it turned into the uh, Library of Lost Gloves and Lost Loves, which I installed um, with uh, some help from my wife, Sarah, in 2022 on Valentine's Day um, at Druid Hill Park. Um, we did sort of a, a gorilla installation um, just, it was fun, kind of a fun, fast project that uh, was a nice kind of respite from doing these very long, intense public art projects that take, take a really long time. And each of these, I can't help when I would see these gloves, I couldn't help but sort of invent these stories in my mind about, you know, maybe who lost them and what some of their, maybe their losses were in their lives. Um, each of these gloves really just like has such a personality to it, you know, this sense of the, the missing human element that, that is there. Um, and so I, I wound up uh, annotating each of the gloves with these kind of, um, kind of like a one line love poem or really what I was, what I was thinking of them as being almost like the first line to a short love story. Um, some of the, uh, some of these notes said, uh, I assumed we'd grow together like two old suburbs. We burned it all down so we could start over. 
sharp words, soft lips. Find a girl who can beat you at Mario Kart. Some of that Romeo, Romeo and Juliet bullshit. And, and I also added, uh, I left a whole stack of these hang tags at the site along with some pens and pencils that are encouraging people to leave their own notes. And of course, you know, since it's a lost and found, it's a library, I wanted people to bring their own gloves that they found here, or perhaps come, come here looking for the, the missing half of their mittens. And it was cool, over the course of the, the project uh, was up for about six weeks, and over the course, um, you know, a lot of gloves got added by people, some of them disappeared, and hopefully maybe got reunited with their other halves. So I've realized, you know, working on this project and a few other ones over the last few years, I've realized that I'm kind of drawn to things that are missing, that are lost, um, places and landscapes that have kind of accrued new meaning over time. One, uh, and, you know, I was thinking about this uh, photo series I've actually been working on for over 20 years. Um, kind of documenting these missing architectural openings, uh, these bricked up doorways and windows that you, know, you can find in any in cities, towns all over the world. And the last few years, I've started uh, approaching the project a little bit more methodically. But each of these you know, bricked up openings has such beauty and personality to it, uh, you know, very similar to a missing glove. There's almost this, I feel like this palpable sense of story and narrative behind this. Like who, who created this? Like did, how much care was put into this bricking up of the opening? What materials did they use? Um, the, there are also, there are all these like beautiful little kind of abstract paintings or sculptures almost. And it's been really fun to just, observe these over the years and photograph and document them. And of course, I, you know, I'm also just, I think, really drawn to the metaphoric qualities of, of sealing off an opening or passageway or a space that used to allow light through and is now sealed off. So it's been, it's a you know, simple subject, but I, you know, I've, as I was saying, I think I've, I've noticed this kind of resonance between this and some of the other uh, projects, like installation projects I've been working on as well. And as I've been you know, observing uh, some of these like missing and altered spaces, I've, I also have been thinking about like ways that we might commemorate and memorialize missing places, uh, objects or landscapes. Um, and think about the, the types of stories that they can tell. Um, this was a, a project proposal from a few years ago for a, a public art installation. Um, you know, Balt Baltimore, of course, a city of row homes. Um, at one time, you imagine most of the city was filled with these very dense blocks, this uh, gridded houses. And today, these are really, you know, it's kind of like missing teeth in the urban fabric, all these like empty lots, houses that have been demolished in the last 60 or 70 years. And so I developed this proposal and I was working on a project uh, with the Neighborhood Design Center uh, called Ghost Stoops that would uh, create this like series of like reinstall at the site of demolished row homes, um, a series of stoops using these kind of like mar uh, sort of marble steps and these glowing portals to frame the, these missing entranceways and kind of commemorate these, uh, these missing spaces. And, you know, because I think a lot of times it's easy to walk, walk past these many vacant lots in Baltimore and not sort of imagine what was here before, that these were, there were, there were homes and stories and lives that were lived on these sites. Um, and also, I, I like the idea, you know, I, going back to some other work, like the idea of creating like a functional project that, again, these, these are seats as well, uh, kind of re-enabling sort of stoop culture to happen 
at these sites again. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm gonna grab a drink. Yeah, and so I also, I wanted to circle back to an older project that we did at Post Typography called The Necessity of Tomorrows. Um, this is a project that I, th I think it's relevant to the work that I'm doing well as, and also to kind of my interdisciplinary background, how I kind of got to, you know, the space that I'm working on now that, I, you know, as, as Hugh mentioned, it really is, I, I think, in, in some ways straddling this line between design and public art and fine art. Um, and uh, to have, we took a multidisciplinary approach with this project as well. So uh, this, I think, I think this was in 2017. Uh, we post typography started working with the Baltimore Museum of Art uh, to help them uh, promote this high-profile lecture series that was focusing on themes that related to, to art, uh, race, social justice. Um, the name for the series comes from an essay by the uh, sci-fi writer Samuel Delaney about the importance of speculative futures. Um, this is Samuel Delaney, wild dude, cool writer. Um, and really just like the importance of this like writing and thinking about the future to envision uh, better possibilities. And since it's, you know, the project was coming from this sort of written, this uh, kind of space from writing and like written inspiration, we started the project uh, not by drawing, but by writing, not by, we wanted to like write all those ideas of like what, what would a better tomorrow look like? What, what would tomorrow look like if school teacher is the highest paid job in America? Or if guns only exist in museum exhibits? Or your doctor makes her a free monthly house call? And this, uh, this kind of like language really became the focal point of the, the marketing campaign, which, you know, we, it also included all of the standard, you know, graphic design, branding stuff that you would do if, if you're trying to get people to come to a lecture series, like posters, postcards, social media ads, website. Um, but the BMA was a really amazing client to have in, in this instance, and they were like super open to us pushing the project beyond just like a standard promotional campaign. And they were really wanting to reach artists or uh, audiences that are outside of the art world bubble. Um, they hadn't done transit advertising in a really long time. And so, and we were like, hey, let's try and get some of these radical statements out into super public spaces. Think about how like we can, you know, maybe inspire some conversations around, around some of these subjects. We also very like in a very like fun way, we were able to push things uh, a little bit further with the project. And we created this series of these kind of detournements, these interventions uh, that were these provocative messages, um, kind of optimistic messages were interrupting signs and you know, uh, spaces that we'd see in the public environment. Uh, for one event, we even made this fake uh, takeout menu that was uh, stuffed into people's mailboxes, um, and the inside was this was a flyer that was promoting the the lecture. So these are obviously you know art projects as much as advertising, but the idea was really just like how can we take some of these themes of the conversation outside the walls of the lecture hall. Um, you know, most of the people who see a you know promotion or like a, you know a poster for a lecture to museum, like ninety eight percent of them are not going to go to the lecture. But maybe there's a way that we can kind of create these little poetic spaces where people can, you know, have room to talk or think about the future. You know, in, in a way that I think you know most of the time we we don't. I mean, we're all very focused on our present moment most of the time. Um, the campaign also included this participatory element where we uh, collected people's ideas and like wishes for tomorrows, um, both through these uh, physical drop boxes as well as on uh, the project website. 
And the, the project website kind of became an archive for all of these submissions. And as the series evolved over the course of, I think it was like maybe three or four years, um, we, were take, we took some of these ideas and statements from people and kind of like fed them back into the work that we were doing. So folks who submitted, submitted some ideas would actually like some, some of their comments we, we took or like we added or like paraphrased for some of the posters or other materials. So it was really kind of a cool collaboration with the you know, uh, BMA community and uh, Baltimore community at large. And I, it, I think it was really fun to create this, like I think an enriched atmosphere and a kind of expanded context for the lecture series beyond what just the, the specific talk or the specific lecture was talking about. And really like allowing people to see some of their own visions captured uh, in the project. So, yeah, I, so I don't normally in, like to show in progress or you know pro projects that are in progress with um, with too many people. Um, par partially because it's just like I don't I don't totally know where this is going yet or what I'm what I'm doing with it. And a lot of times, something that I've started winds up completely evolving or changing um, from the beginning to the end. But uh, I wanted to share like this project that doesn't doesn't have a title now. Maybe it's going to be called Automotive Repair. I don't know, but it's uh, but I thought it was kind of a nice tie-in to like some some of the the, the previous pro like the necessity of tomorrow's work as well as um, some other uh, stuff like ghost rivers and some other projects I've been working on recently. Um, car car names, yeah. Uh, I've always there's obviously a very deep irony of calling your full-size SUV, a Denali or a Sequoia. Um, it's something I, I've, you know, as, I have a, as a background as a designer who's worked in the communications industry, um, I've always, it's, it, it always fascinates me how some of these decisions get made. And the, you know, the car is obviously pro like one of the most destructive inventions in human history, yet we're, giving it the names of some of like our most beautiful landscapes in the world. And a few years ago, I started like doodling these ideas that I, I kind of thought of as being, I guess, a installation concept proposal and like not totally sure. But I was like, you know, what if you took a GMC Acadia and it became kind of a uh, new habitat for all of the flora and fauna of Acadia National Park or a Toyota Tundra that has been sunk into the perma permafrost and is a you know, home for Arctic terns. Um, I have, uh, so I, I have, you know, I'm sure like everyone like pretty mixed feelings about AI, generative AI, but I, I was interested in like, experimenting with it as a tool, you know, specifically to, you know, I, I think it has like a generative AI has a fairly limited stylistic palette, but it's really good at making stuff that looks like a car ad. So I was like, cool, let's make this uh, the Sequoia with that's crushed by a nurse log, but with a beautiful studio lighting um, in a way that uh, if I ever did some kind of installation like this uh, would probably not look as beautifully photographed as this. Um, the Tuareg. Um, yeah, a gl glacier advancing over Denali. Um, sub suburban lawn removal. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I think and there's also kind of a perverse fun in seeing a car destroyed by the kind of the landscape that it's named after as well. Um, this is another uh, Acadia iteration. Uh, Tucson. Um, 
and yeah, so again, I'm not I'm not totally sure where where this project is is ultimately going, other than kind of doing these ex explorations now. But uh, you know, eventually in a hundred years, when a swar however long it takes a swaro to grow through uh, an SUV, maybe it will look like that. <clears throat> so anyway, if I, I wanted to. And end up with you know talking about talking a little bit more in depth about Ghost Rivers, which is um, as, as you mentioned, is a, a project that I have been work, working on for the last four years. It's mostly complete at this point. Um, it's a, a public art installation that also has writing, research, a lot a lot of different components to it, which I'll I'll get into some of them in a second. Um, and it. Really, that kind of invites this, uh, these different types of explorations with uh, public space. Um, giving like a little bit of a backstory about the project, I maybe about ten years ago, I was looking at an antique map of Baltimore, and I saw on uh, running through the middle of Remington and Charles Village, just you know a few blocks from where I live, this stream and a pond that today is no longer there. There's no, there's no trace of it. Um, this is what the site of the pond looks like today. Uh, it was something I had like filed away in the back of my head as like, huh, that's a cool fact that there was a river here. But I you know, gradually started you know, thinking, thinking about this idea, like maybe I can do some kind of project that would commemorate or memorialize this stream and I, I was wondering too, is you know, is this maybe this is one of these buried urban streams that I know, like Baltimore has many of them. It's something that is in you know pretty much every city in the world. Um, this, and you can see on this uh, this map, like everything in green here is like a lost wetland or river stream body of water. Um, you know, Baltimore, you know, 400, 500 years ago. Most of the, the area looked like this: these, you know, wooded valleys, hillsides, marshlands, streams running through them. Um, the same areas today looks like this. Um, this is over the site of Sumwalt Run, the stream that was I, I saw on the old map. Um, so, you know, two hundred years ago, there was a stream running through here. And the stream still runs through here. Um, this is basically what it, this is what it looks like 30 feet below where that last photo was taken. Um, Sumwalt Run it was buried in the early uh, early 20th century into a concrete culvert um, that's about two about uh, three two and a half three miles long. Um, I, I love sharing this photo with people because it's it really like illustrates this burial process as it's happening. Uh, this was a small stream over in Hamden. Um, you can kind of see over over on the right there is uh, this like little creek, uh, much like smaller than some old run, but this tiny creek running through a valley. Um, and then these gentlemen are building this massive concrete tube through which the stream now runs. <clears throat> And yeah, similarly to Sumwalt Run, this, this area, the valley is totally filled in. There's now houses on top of it, uh, streets. You'd have no idea that there, there was once a, a creek here. So this, all of this was like really kind of an astounding feat of engineering and ingenuity, um, as well as hubris. But the you know, I think all of the these streams were uh, like these storm sewer system, these culverts through which all these streams now run, were designed using like the most cutting edge engineering of the day. There were the side, the diameter of all these tubes was carefully calculated to be able to handle, you know, a fifty or hundred year storm. Um, they were very like strongly constructed, and. Really, at the you know, in the spirit of the age, like these were you know, kind of replacing the sort of inefficient, d dirty creeks with these sleek mechanical constructions, um, and it was you know very celebrated when Baltimore's sewer system was constructed. Um, at the time, 
Baltimore had one of the most advanced uh, water and sewer systems in the world. Um, we, we had a separated sewer system, which meant that the stormwater and the sanitary sewers went to different places, which at the time most cities didn't have, and many still don't. And it was all well and good. Everyone championed the new sewer system, but of course, nature has its own plans. Um, occasionally, especially some of the older sections of these tunnels, even in the early 20th century, they would flood underground and causing these sinkholes, roads would collapse. And that still you know, occasionally happens today. While I was working on the, this project, uh, a section of Sumwalt Run in Charles Village, uh, the, the culvert collapsed and created a, a small sinkhole, which th thankfully uh, nobody, nobody was hurt, or I think it was minimal damage. But yeah, so these buried creeks, they're you know, mostly forgotten, but they're still very much with us. Um, Sumwalt Run today, is completely underground. There's no, no trace of its waters see light until it empties out into the Jones Falls. So I wanted to do a project that would, there's kind of a, like, like a monument to this lost landscape and this lost stream. Ghost rivers, um, as can see, the idea was really to like map the course of this waterway. Um, the ultimate, like the installations when they're, the final ones are completed uh, in May, it's gonna stretch the, over a course of about a mile and a half length of this stream. And everywhere that the, um, the you know, former path of the stream crosses a, a road or um, sidewalk, the public right of ways, um, it marked its path. And I wanted to, you know, take this kind of cartographic approach that, um, you know, also like use the sort of visual language of the, you know, streetscape and the built environment, um, and being, you know, very, very int intentionally using the kind of iconography of water. Um, the blue was directly inspired by old maps, and you know, the wave. Everyone, as we all draw when we're kids. Um, at each, uh, and the, the markings, I should say, they're, it's made from a torch down thermoplastic, which is it's the same material that is used for um, bike lane decals. So it's, it's something that one was approved by the Department of Transportation because they were, as, as you can imagine, very, very, very particular about what uh, went on, what I was allowed to do with their roads. Um, and two, it's something that's going to, is going to last a little bit longer than paint and like hold, hold up and look a little bit better. Um, at each site, there's also an you know, interpretive signage that talks a little bit about the history of the stream, um, the neighborhood, Baltimore's urban development, um, ecology, issues like climate change. Um, I really you know, wanted the project to have, pull on some of these disparate threads um, you know, let, let people connect them as they went through it. Because, you know, I mean, this ghost is it's essentially like a conceptual art project, but I wanted it to be still be something that's like super accessible and engaging for um, for as many, many people as possible. And something that, you know, if you live in the neighborhood that you wouldn't, you know, enjoy having like near your house. Um, Oh yeah, and the, as you can see, the cutouts and the signs are also like line up with the markings on the, the ground. <clears throat> this was really the, the project, um, the first project they did, or as you say, the project that I've done that has had the greatest amount of historic uh, research or just generally research that went into it. Um, there were just like a ton, a ton of stories and like archival digging that I uh, learned about in the process. And, a lot of this really came from you know, interest from the community. Like when I, start, when I brought this to neighborhood meetings in Remington, people were asking me questions about the history of this stream and I didn't have answers yet. So I yeah, had, had to go 
figure it out and like find them out. Uh, inter there were a lot of very cool um, kind of like serendipitous things that I, I learned in the course of the project. One, um, so Sumwalt Ice Pond was actually the site of the first commercial ice distribution business in Baltimore City. Um, because if you think back to you know the 1840s and 50s, if you wanted ice, the only like there weren't freezers. The only way to get ice was to cut it out of a lake or a river during the winter, store it in an underground ice house uh, or like a, a insulated ice house uh, until the summer um, when demand was high for it, and then you could you take you send your ice cart delivery carts out around the city to take ice to your customers. Um, ironically, most of these ice companies, their sort of side business during the winter was selling coal when you know, obviously not a lot of demand for ice. So um, they would you know, send their carts out with coal. So by the kind of like early 20th century, winters were starting to get warmer. So a little less reliable to get ice from a lake. Um, but also, there is, uh, you're starting to have the spread of this kind of uh, artificial ice, you know, manufactured ice, uh, these different chemical and uh, mechanical technologies. And so the natural ice business basically just started to disappear. And you know, today, we, have, we can go to our freezer, get some ice cubes out. Um, interestingly, across from there, there's a, a second, uh, an actual like a manufactured ice factory that is also along this stream, unrelated to the ice pond. Um, but across the street from that is a, a power substation. So, really, this the kind of full history of the ice industry was is visible within um, a mile along the path of the stream. So yeah, it was uh, it, it was really it was interesting, like trying to tell all of these, you know, trying to figure out how to tell all of these stories, and again to this this idea that like wanted to make the project accessible and sort of touch on a few different, um, you know, like take on a for, like a format that was more than just uh, you know a line on the ground. I I designed this walking tour around the project that also has a, this companion website that has a lot of multimedia, like interesting information about buried streams, um, ecology, history. Um, and so, so that you know, people can experience the project even if they don't live in Baltimore or they don't come to visit the site. Um, yeah, and, and as I mentioned, like a lot of this, the kind of this history focus, a lot of it came you know, directly from interest from neighbors in Remington. And we did a ton of community engagement for this project, like huge amounts. Uh, included, I, I went, attended like many, many, many community meetings, church, uh, church groups, went out and just like talked to neighbors. Um, we did some you know, events at the neighborhood festival with, um, uh, I partnered with Blue Water Baltimore, who's an amazing uh, watershed advocacy organization here in Baltimore. Uh, lots of there, like many, many folks were involved who I, um, don't, I'm not going to thank everyone here, but there's just like, a, a, it was really, uh, even though like the, I, I, it was my project, it was really, I couldn't have done it without the help of so many people. Um, we did uh, a series of like walking, guided walking tours, um, of which we're, we're planning to do some more this spring, uh, opening a community celebration. And then earlier, kind of at the beginning of the project, I did a lot of um, community history workshops and then one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, longtime Re Remington residents. Because I, I thought it was like really important to try and bring in these kind of like local, like really like hyper-local histories, memories, community voices into the project. This, this is an amazing quote. Um, there are, there's actually a handful of uh, residents who had had their own stories about like skateboarding through the tunnels of Stony Run, um, which is actually Stony Run is the other partially buried stream that's in Remington that uh, most more people know about. 
And that, you know, I think one of the things that drew me to the projects in, in general, and like that I really love about public spaces is, and public projects is trying to make that connection between, you know, things that ha are happening in our own neighborhoods, our own backyards with bigger picture things like climate change and urban infrastructure. Um, there are all these layers of history, community, culture, different ecologies that happen in our cities. And, you know, typically we, you know, we're just passing through a place, we don't really have a chance to uh, glimpse these. And, you know, with Ghost Rivers, I really wanted to, you know, peel back some of the layers, um, you know, as just in the way that working on the project did for me and give, you know, give other people the chance to sort of like use their imaginations, look into the past, um, as well as to look into the future and envision new possibilities. So, thanks. Um, and yeah, and I think we, we've got some time for some questions. I know, uh, you know, especially like those of you who are students, I mean, feel, feel free to ask me anything, like any kind of question. No, it can be like super mundane. It could be super philosophical. Um, I definitely, you know, as I went through, I, ha I have my, my career has kind of, you know, flown around a lot. I am definitely a, a generalist <laughs> um, and have ta you know, taken a lot of different routes. And I definitely, I still feel like my work and practice is, is evolving. So yeah, feel, and I know you all are also like figuring out things right now. So feel free to ask away. Yes. Um. The amount of research you've done is really incredible. Uh, I was wondering, I remember years ago, I went on a number of sewage safaris by a gentleman that lived in Bernhampton or Remington. Have you heard about those? No, I, I haven't. Oh, how, did, how, did, how did nobody tell me about that? What? I, I don't know. How did I not find out about the sewage I'm safaris? Yeah. It would be in the newspaper, you would look at it, and you would meet in different areas and forget his name. And um, uh, I would say about three or four years ago, uh, there was a show here about the water, and uh, someone actually knew who he was. He was an older man, and he dressed like he was on a wear a fifth helmet, and he had masks, and he worked for the city for a long time. And um, do you know a uh, Red Dirt um, Studios in, uh, uh, anyway, she works with soil a lot and right. dirt and levels of dirt. Mm -hmm. She was familiar. And uh, he would make little booklets nowhere near as sort of organized and laid out. Mm -hmm. He did many rivers. And he, he would go, okay, we're going to go to the mountain. This river, you go through the woods, you cross highways, and you find that like, this is the where this goes, and this is. And it's called, and it was great sewage supply. <laughs> so um, ask around if you could. Okay. It's definitely existed, and would be gravel of maybe 10 people. That's. Maybe that, that's a that was a great tip. I I, want, I need to look up sewage safaris. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, luckily, the the city in you know the past twenty years has done a pretty good job. They've like mostly cleaned up a lot of the storm sewer systems. Um, because you know even though again Baltimore like ostensibly the storm sewer and the st or stormwater sewer and the sanitary sewers are separate. There, you know, the stuff's like over 100 years old. There were leaks. There were illegal connections where people's sewage lines were just like dumping right into, um, you know, storm drains. Um, mostly has been cleaned up. Still, uh, when we went into the into the somewhat run sewer, we tried really, really hard not to touch the water. Um, but but yeah, I would, uh, yeah, I feel like doing that. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, probably was pretty harrowing. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. Um, have you looked into or do you know of any like urban restoration projects going on in Baltimore? I've heard of some going on, like, I have some done in Paris and I've heard of some in China. Yeah, so, um, you know, so the question was asking about river restoration projects. And I think you're specifically maybe talking about daylighting, like opening up a, a buried river. Yeah, so there, um, there is, like, there's kind of been a movement in the last 20 or 30 years to uncover, like, open up some of these buried streams. So it's called, like, daylighting is the, the terminology. Um, and it's been done really successfully in a handful of places. Um, it, it's incredibly expensive and comp complicated. Um, if you have a, you know, a stream like, you know, some Walt Run, so if you imagine, you know, almost all of this stream, you know, there's ho houses and roads and stuff on top of it, it would be, you know, very challenging to, you know, you know take this and um, daylight it. Um, that said, the, you know, the Jones Falls in Baltimore, uh, this is, it's, Definitely something like I, I've kind of been hoping my project will spur like conversation about like what is the future of the Jones Falls Expressway and the buried part of the Jones Falls because uh, you know I think as many of you know it the Jones Falls also runs into tunnels starting around Penn Station and go, going down to the harbor um, the expressway which was built in the um, 50 or the 60s and 70s is kind of nearing the end of its lifespan and you know it some point in the next 20 or 30 years, the city is going to be spending like probably like upwards of a billion dollars to rebuild this. So I, it would be great if we started planning ahead to tear, tear down the expressway and re restore the Jones Falls. Um, and there, there actually have, um, to get back to your question, uh, there, there have been a lot of people or like some people who have, proposed ideas for this and have talked about it for, you know, a few decades. Um, it's, I feel like it's starting to come up in conversation a little bit more. Uh, there aren't any daylighting projects currently in the works in Baltimore city or like, or like actually in like the Baltimore region. Um, DC has done a couple, they, they, I think they just, they completed, they maybe completed two, um, and these are like really small streams, like less than a mile, you know, maybe like a, a fifth of a mile in length that are within parks. And it was like, and the reason they did that is because it, it's easy. They didn't have to, you know, buy property from someone or do public domain or, and there's not a ton of stuff on top of it. So it's, it definitely, it, there are a lot of, it, it's challenging. It was you know, as challenging as it was to bury these streams, it's exponentially more difficult and expensive to unbury them, which, you know, like many of the things that people do. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I noticed near the delineation of Stonewall Park and the Ghost River, the storm drains are covered with um, what looks like rocks, chunks of rocks and stuff. Is that related to your project? Oh, uh, that, so that actually, I think what you're talking about on uh, 20, 24th Street, that was actually related to the construction work that was happening there. Um, uh, B, yeah, uh, BGE actually came and they dug up half of one of these about a month after we installed it. Um, uh, no big deal. Um, only been working on this for years. But we're, we're actually, we're going to actually reinstall it this, that, this spring. But yeah, I think that, that was actually done. It's a a stormwater mitigation issue. It actually sort of filters the, theoretically is supposed to filter the water. I don't know how much it actually does. Um, yeah. 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 So how, how difficult is it to do this project from, from kind of a bureaucratic standpoint? Um, Challenging, very challenging. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, part of the reason the project has taken so long is uh, having, so like this, this project, like, all the installations are, like for the most part, they're all within uh, public spaces that are owned by the Department of Transportation and the Department of Recreation and Parks. So actually two different agencies having, having to work through, which is why, why the one in the park isn't done yet. Um, 
the yeah it's uh, baltimore actually is probably in some ways better than other cities in that there is a process in place for doing projects that are in the public right of way called it's called the row art program um, and the, the city established it a few years ago to facilitate, um, you've seen all like kind of the art crosswalks around. And so that's something that has been, you know, there's been proliferating in Baltimore and they're like, oh, we need to formalize the kind of process for if a community wants to install one of these. So I, the city like did have a program in place, which, which was like really helpful with some guidelines, even though they were really kind of vague and they, there's just like a lot, the, the biggest back and forth was really you know, doing a lot of the different, uh, like developing the design, you know, with the city, because I had to go through all these different rounds with the Department of Transportation and each of the different uh, divisions within Department of Transportation had to review the concepts and say, okay, this is okay. Like, no, you, like, I mean, they, they, they have some like pretty, you know, basic things like any markings that you put on the ground, they can't, they can't be the same color as a roadway marking. So I couldn't, you know, couldn't do like yellow or white or green or red. Um, they, I actually originally wanted to do the, um, the project out of concrete or asphalt, like dyed concrete. Um, but they, they basically like, you can't do anything that disturbs the road, roadbed surface. It has to be applied on top. Um, so, so really like kind of the, the process influenced the design. And I, I tried to, you know, to, uh, I intentionally was trying to be like really flexible with like not get too married to what it would look like at the beginning of the project because I, I knew that it was going to change whether I liked it or not. Um, so yeah, I was very, very involved. Um, it, uh, honestly, it was like a huge learning project for me that I, I just, I, I had never done a project like of this scale before and that I really, I did like, you know, all the fundraising, all of the, like, you know, really led all the community engagement stuff, working with the municipal agency. Uh, the neighborhood association was in Remington was really great. And that, you know, I'd say like anyone who's interested in doing a public project, like start there, like talk to people in the neighbor, like get, get some allies in the neighborhood who can connect you with the right people to who can help you out and, you know, have just, you know, be supportive of you when you need it. Um, and, and yeah, they were in the uh, GRIA, the, the neighborhood association, they're, they're a fiscal sponsor of the project as well. So like re a really crucial partner. Um, but yeah. Difficult. I would recommend if you're if you're considering doing a public space project, starting on uh, a much smaller scale, and and I think also if you know I think like other projects I'd done, they've been they've sort of been like owned by you know it's like oh it's a site that's owned by the library and so like the library is really invested in making this happen and you know and this is Department of Transportation doesn't give a damn about this project. <laughs> Although they did, they did post it on their Instagram a lot after it was done. I, ironically, they were posting on their Instagram before they'd given us their final permit, but that's, that's a really long story. Um, <clears throat> did that process, like you're training as a graphic designer, you know, you all that work that you did in the most part of it, yeah, that, that's that's a really great question, and I, you know, I think my background as a graphic designer was hugely helpful in working on this project, and not not just like designing a cool looking sign, but I, you know, like the bulk, probably a third of this project, or more. Well, if you count like you know, doing like all the pitches and like community meetings and, you know, writing uh, grant application, everything, you know, more than half of the work on this project was doing that kind of stuff and project management and things like that. And so, you know, being able to tell a story visually, like design a really nice pitch deck that you're presenting to the community association or to people that you're asking to help, help you like do research or something on the project is is huge um you know i think 
the the project, you know, we got, had to get a lot of different grants to fund the project and doing, you know, kind of, I think like my background in design and, you know, working, doing client, met, like doing proposals, working with clients, you know, I think it helped me figure out the grant writing process, which is like, it's cumbersome, it's hard, it's a lot of work. Um, but again, being able to say, hey, I, cool, I have this like really cool proposal thing and I can sort of adapt it for this grant application. I'm, you know, surely it helps, uh, you know, the project get some funding as well. So, so yeah, I think, you know, those of you who have a design background, even if you don't, I think kind of having some of these, even just like, just like kind of like basic visual communication skills are like, really important to like selling your idea to people and get, getting people to understand what you're trying to do and hopefully get behind it and help pay for it. What was the budget? I mean, and so yeah. I think that if you look at the chairs, that was probably like the commission, right? mm -hmm. like you, you know, that was sort of your working yeah. This, I don't know for a fact, but it sounds like this was something that you Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I can. I'm happy to be like transparent about. It. So you know, a typical so the the budget for the chairs. Um, I don't remember. It was something like maybe seventy five thousand dollars, or maybe maybe. It's, Tiny bit more, but and that include included all of the, like design fee, like materials, fabrication. Um, it's sounds like an amazing, like a huge amount of money. It goes really fast. Um, the this project, the budget was around one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Which again, you're like, whoa, that's amazing. It's I mean, it definitely is like a huge project. Um, I probably spent almost probably maybe around 1800 hours working on this project. Um, and that's just like my, my time. That doesn't include what I, um, you know, paying to have the signs fabricated or I, I worked with a um, professional road striping company to help, help me do the installations. Um, it's, you know, so, I mean, like each of the sites just like kind of like the installation costs and in, in, which includes some of my labor, but just the installation cost for each site was, Generally, like ten to twelve thousand um, dollars, and then plus all the time you know writing, doing grant management, project management, um, things like that. And I paying, uh, I hired a friend of mine to do some drone, those cool drone photographs. Um, so it's, I think you know in the future, I, I feel like I sort of better. I I could probably do the project a little more efficiently, where I do it again. I would sort of understand my time a little bit better, so I'd pay myself more. Hopefully, um, <laughs> it's yeah. I think that's it is especially so. Yeah, this was a completely self-initiated project, which makes it a little more challenging because I'm also like doing all this legwork in terms of hey, I'm getting I have to do this background just to get people to think that this is a good idea to do a public art project here so that I can write the, so then they will partner with me so that I can then write the grant to pay for like three installations at a time, you know, in like five grants or whatever. Um, the, for those of you who are interested in that kind of stuff though, the uh, Maryland State Arts Council has um, these, what are called creativity grants that I think are around like $3,000 and they, I actually, I got one of those kind of the beginning of the project, which I used basically for, for planning it. Um, I, it. I used it to help pay myself for writing the first grant, um, which the first big grant that we got, which was about fi almost $50,000, um, which took me about 100 hours to put together. <laughs> um, yeah, the grant, grant, is, grant writing is kind of thankless and, the uh, Maryland State Arts Council, luckily, they have like a very, very streamlined process. Um, so it was, which was great because I had that $50,000 grant that I was just telling about was for the Maryland Historic Trust. And it was like really, really long. And that's, that's, you know, that's why it took that 
like 100 hours. Um, but also as part of that 100 hours, I had to like, I had to figure out a lot of stuff about the project because, you know, before then it was like, yeah, here's all these, I have all these ideas and I think I know this and I think I know this, but then I'm like, oh, I've got, I have to put together a legit budget for it. I have to, you know, these partners that I kind of talked to about maybe I need to get them to write like a letter of support. Um, I had to, you know, there, so I, I think that doing that kind of legwork and backgrounds, it was really helpful in terms of building the momentum and getting the project going. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a crazy world. Like if, if you all are thinking of getting in, into that sort of public art realm, there's a lot of things that you have, you'll learn about that side of things, like the grant, grant writing, community engagement, project management, um, you know, working with municipal agencies, but it's, you know, I think these processes are, you know, there for a reason. So it's like some, mostly a lot, like some of them are bullshit, but you know, it's, it is, uh, you know, I think it, it's good to be able to go and like get people on board. And I think we had like really, really, really high levels of community support for this project, which reflects the amount of time that was required by the process. So there, there are some like good elements to the process for sure. Um, yes. Along with that, it feels like I keep hearing you talk about the length of time here and a lot of like perseverance that has happened <laughs> yes. with public art. And like, I mean, it sounds like it's like architecture, but then you're doing it as like a self-initiated thing. Um, yeah. What was the, like, when was the moment that you knew like this is gonna happen? Like how far is this? <laughs> oh man, I don't, I don't know. Cause I feel like I also had, but, you know, I, I'm kind of like backing up a little bit. You know, coming from the graphic design world where I'm like, sometimes we get like an illustration project and I'm like, okay, cool. We, you guys have five hours to do this illustration and it runs in the paper the next day, um, which is like, immediate gratification, stressful, but also immediate gratification to something where I'm like, cool, I have this idea and maybe in three or four years it will happen, which yeah, it's like architect timeline. Um, I, I don't know, well, I think, first of all, I got the, the first official like, like big funding I got, I got a, a Gutierrez Memorial Fund grant in, was it 2021 maybe? I think in 2021. Um, which at the time it was going to fund like one, I was going to do one site first and it would have funded barely, not even really one site. Like it would have funded like half of a site, but I'm like, I'll just do, I'll figure out how to do one site with, with this. Um, I thought it was going to be installed within a year. Um, and it took three years, um, for some of the aforementioned reasons. Um, at several points during the project, I thought that it wasn't going to happen. Um, I, you know, especially, and I think some of this back and forth with Department of Transportation in particular, like I had this particular contact I'd been working with there was incredibly disorganized and I would email and call her and email and call her and then she'd eventually get back to me and be like, oh, what was, what was your project called again? And like, and, and, and the kind of thing like, oh, cool. So the thing, the question I asked you, like, four months ago that was a really simple answer that I, I needed to like move forward. You still don't know the answer to. And, and then they were telling every time I talked to someone, they, I'd get like a different answer from them about, and then, and then I think at one point was told like, they were like, Oh, you can't, you can't install these signs unless they're uh, eight feet off the ground. And I was like, it's like, like, you know, these are like pedestrian signs. <laughs> Yeah, but they're like, you know, so it's like, you know, so it's, so it's like cars won't or like, and anyway, it was eventually it, but yeah, it was a lot of perseverance kind of dealing with that kind of stuff. And I think, I think it was, it was also kind of a helpful lesson in me because I, I, I easily get like, really like, I'd like freak out every time I get an email like that. And kind of just like remembering that, uh, I feel like, and this is, you know, something I've also just like learned as I've gotten older and, you know, even when we're doing like client projects, you get some like shitty email from a client 
And you're just like, oh my God, like, what the fuck? And, and, and like, you'd be like mad about it for 24 hours. And like, you're just like, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna, we're gonna fire them, we can't work. And then, and just sort of in, in trying to like step back and being like, okay, this is this thing that is this like crazy problem. What is, what are they like really telling you? Like, what are they trying to say? And sort of like trying, trying to kind of imagine it from the other person's perspective and sort of understand, oh, okay, well, this person is like, she's just like reading this rule in the rule book about signs, but this is actually a sign for a car. And I, I just need to, I've been trying not to go over this person's head because I'm working with them, but this is the instance where I need to go over their head and talk to their, like their director. And he was like, oh yeah, this is fine. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I think per perseverance and not, yeah, not letting things like, yeah, tr trying to like just think about different ways to approach the problem and sort of understanding that there are a wide variety of people in the world and trying to meet them where, where they are, I think is really, really important for working on a public project. Um, Any more questions? Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Cool. Thanks.